So for tonight, um, we're really fortunate to have uh, Joe Lichardi uh, join us here and talk about work that he's been doing for a long, long time actually, and continues to do here in, in Jackson Hole itself. Um, Joe is the department chair and professor in the Department of Earth Scientist at the University of New Hampshire. His primary areas of research expertise include glacial geology, geomorphology, paleoclimatology, and volcanology. And he will be talking quite a bit about the application of cosmogenic isotope surface exposure dating methods, which he'll explain here, and how that figures prominently in many of these projects, and how it really is important to understanding you know, the geology, what we see around us here in, in Jackson Hole. Uh, Joe's main study sites are located in the Western United States, Iceland, Peruvian Chilean Andes, but his research group has also worked projects in New England, Alaska, Hawaii, and Greenland, and he's published extensively, if you look uh, and look for his work, on the glacial history of the Greater Yellowstone and Grand Teton regions, and that's what he's going to primarily focus on here tonight. So without further ado, I'd ask you to join me in welcoming Joe Lachardi. Thanks, Joe, for being with us. Thank you, John. Um, I hope that everybody can hear me. And uh, I'd like to start by just saying it's a real honor to be uh, giving a presentation to this group. It's been, I've always uh, had an ambition to be able to be part of this uh, talk series. So it's it's really it's really great to be doing this. And um, so I'm just missing the opportunity to give this in person, but um, hopefully we'll, um, we'll have a good uh, Zoom presentation for tonight. Um, <clears throat> So let me um, get started here with sharing my slides. And thumbs up if everybody can see this. OK, so um, as John said, um, I'm going to be talking about the glacial history of uh, right here in the uh, backyard of Jackson, Jackson Hole, uh, the Teton Range, but also um, talking a lot about uh, glaciers further to the north in, in Yellowstone. And um, I'll also be talking specifically about the Teton Fault uh, in the second part of my talk. I have a lot of collaborators on projects, uh, past, present, and ongoing. You can see some of the names down there at the bottom. Um, and I'll, I'll go through um, the work that I've been doing with, with some of these folks here. Um, Ken Pierce, Glenn Thackeray, Darren Larson, uh, Mark Zellman, Chris Duras, Abriel Schweinsberg, Alia Lesnick, and many more. Um, so the opening photo here is probably a familiar scene, uh, is a very familiar scene to all of you who have, have the, the fortune, good fortune of living here. Pretty much everything that you see in this photograph has been sculpted or shaped in some way, shape, or form by glaciers. Um, and in fact, much of the foreground, uh, those flat terraces that you're seeing there, much of those deposits are actually coming from the Yellowstone glacial system which was actually not known to the earliest geologists who did their mapping in this region. And all of the valleys that you see there in the Tetons uh, looking along the Eastern Range Front have been uh, beautifully sculpted and scooped out by uh, valley glaciers. Before I get into the science of tonight's talk, I wanna dedicate this talk to Ken Pierce, um, who sadly passed away on July 9th. I know that um, some of you in the audience knew Ken, um, and he was, I think it's fair to say he, he was a legend uh, and the work that he did here on the glacial history is unsurpassed. Uh, and to me, Ken was my longtime colleague, mentor um, and friend. I just wanted to show a couple of slides here of him doing work in the field. This, this predates um, my time working with Ken. Back in the 60s, this is Ken mapping on horseback in Southern Yellowstone, uh, putting together what uh, just an extraordinary amount of work. Um, in Yellowstone. More recently, this was a trip that we co-led in 2003, and that's Ken um, with his ever-present map uh, talking about the Jackson Hole glaciation um, from the Curtis Canyon Overlook. Here's another shot of Ken explaining the Teton Fault. This is on the shores of the northern Jackson Lake, uh, another trip there from 2003. Uh, and then finally, here's another one of Ken actually uh, taking some samples for cosmogenic isotope dating. Uh, and that's actually going to be a lot of what I talk about uh, tonight is the results of that work. 
So a lot of what I'm talking about um, builds on, I'm resting on the shoulders of many, many, many folks, um, not just Ken, but many other folks who've been working here in, in Yellowstone. But I, I have to highlight this particular professional paper that Ken uh, pr produced uh, and published in 1979, um, which I think in the minds of many glacial geologists who've worked in this part of the world uh, stands as the, the definitive example of exhaustively thorough field observations and conceptual models of glaciation in the Western US. And it, it was certainly a great inspiration to me uh, to start working out here. Um, and it's really an extraordinary piece of work. Ken um, won the highest honor given by uh, the Geological Society of America's Quaternary Geology and Geomorphology Division, the Kirk Bryan Award, um, just a couple, few years after he um, published this paper. If we fast forward a couple, few decades, um, I started working with Ken in the 90s and I've been working here ever since. Um, we put out two um, pretty major reports in 2018. So that was a good, good year for us to, um, to publish the, our latest ideas on the history and dynamics of glaciation in Yellowstone, also in the Teton range. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about in the first part of my talk is really coming from these reports. And um, you can easily find these online. And if you can't, I'd be happy to provide them. <clears throat> One of these reports was focused specifically on Jackson Hole. That's that uh, cover shot there to the left. Um, another professional paper, uh, summing up a lot of the geology here. And then we also had a review paper in Quaternary Science Reviews um, that is focused more on the Yellowstone glacial system. So just to sort of unfold that cover of the professional paper, this is a, a photo I took uh, close to the Snake River Overlook. The ridge that you see in the foreground here is a beautiful moraine, um, but it doesn't have a lot of boulders on it. And as I said before, many geologists in this part of the world in the valley here originally assumed these were deposits from valley glaciers coming out of the Tetons. But in fact, this is actually marking the southernmost extent of the Yellowstone ice cap. And a little bit beyond this moraine, you see a sort of a dark shadowy region. That's actually a big kettle hole. So there's all kinds of beautiful glacial features here in, in Jackson Hole. So let me start off very broadly and then I'll, I'll bring us into um, the field area. So this is a map of the Western US. This was published uh, just last year in a review paper uh, that I was involved in looking at not just Yellowstone, but a lot of these mountain glacier systems that existed across the Western US during the last ice age. So the Pleistocene. So everywhere you see a, a white blob on this map, those are independent mountain glacier um, locations south of the big continental ice sheets to the north, like the Laurentide and the Cordilleran. And there's the Yellowstone ice cap right there for reference. It was the largest of all of the glaciers, uh, the independent mountain glaciers during the last ice age, only rivaled by possibly the Sierra Nevada um, ice cap. You also see some really large lakes here, um, Lake Bonneville and Lake Lahontan and others. That's also an important part of Western US um, paleogeography during the last ice ages. And there's a lot of information here that I'm not going to talk about, but all the colored dots here are places where we have actual numerical ages where we know when these glaciers were at their maximum. Um, so it gives you kind of an idea of what we know and what we don't know about Western US glaciers and when they were at their largest. I'm going to zoom in here uh, to this red box and uh, blow that up in the next figure and talk more specifically about Yellowstone and why that ice cap was so large. Well, there's a, a number of reasons for that. And many of them actually have to do with the track of the Yellowstone hotspot, which is also a, a major area of research that um, Ken and many others have been involved in. I know Bob Smith's on the call here too. Um, and I'll be talking about his work later. So what you see here, is um, the Eastern Snake River Plain. And all of these uh, circles here are volcanic centers, essentially showing the track of the Yellowstone hotspot prior to its arrival in Yellowstone a little over 2 million years ago. This big horseshoe shaped um, outline here is what we call the Yellowstone Crescent of High Terrain. A lot of big mountain ranges, a lot of high terrain in this, in this horseshoe. Uh, we think of this almost like a bow wave um, in advance of the Yellowstone hotspot as, um, as the North, North American plate is moving over a stationary plume. Um, so there's a lot of high ground here that is fertile ground for growing glaciers. 
Yellowstone being one of the largest of those areas. So that geography is in part responsible for why we get such large glaciers in Yellowstone. But also the Snake River Plain itself, because it's a lowland, that almost acts as if it's a conduit or a funnel for a lot of storms and those storms move along the Snake River Plain. And when they encounter the high terrain of Yellowstone and other mountain ranges here, that pr produces very deep snowfalls or a graphic snowfall. And so if you combine that with a lot of high terrain, really high snowfall totals, you're gonna grow some pretty big glaciers. I'm also gonna point out, I'm talking about the Teton Fault in the latter part of my talk and these black lines on the map here um, are all major faults. Um, the Teton Fault is, is a big normal fault. And I should also say this, this is based on a paper that Ken published with Lisa Morgan in 1992 and we're really just um, adapting it for our purposes here. So if we think a little bit more about the climate, which is such an important part of the story here, if we look at the figure there on the left, those are annual um, precipitation totals with the darker purple regions being greater amounts of precipitation. So just really reinforcing what I was showing in that previous figure, you can see how snowfall totals are very high on the western edge of, really it's sort of the southwestern edge of the Yellowstone Plateau where those storms are, are encountering high ground and that causes a lot of moisture to be extracted from those clouds as they're um, sh uh, shoved up and over that high terrain. If we look along that red line as a transect, the cartoon that we have there on the right hand side is, is conceptually showing the growth of those clouds and the extraction of precipitation on the plateau. It's just as important to our climatic story um, that when you get to the east side of the Yellowstone Plateau, much of the moisture has already been wrung out of those storm systems and we end up having a pretty severe precipitation shadow in the Bighorn Basin. So snowfall totals drop right back down in the Bighorn Basin. And that's, um, that's a shadow, a precipitation shadow. We believe that in the last ice age and previous ice ages, these general patterns of precipitation probably, um, probably approximated what you're seeing here, at least in terms of their geographic distribution. So now I'm gonna um, zoom in on Yellowstone here. I'm gonna use this, this base map here. Um, and there's probably some familiar places here, but there's the town of Jackson is right there uh, for reference. And of course, Yellowstone Lake right there in the middle and go over a review of, of some of the work that we published on um, and put out in these reports from 2018. We call this the Greater Yellowstone Glacial System because it comprises a whole, uh, a lot of different ice masses that all coalesce together to form one big continuous ice cap. And the Teton Range itself, it's, it's kind of, it's not easy to envision this when you're driving around Jackson Hole and looking at the Tetons, but the ice that came from the Tetons was actually quite small uh, compared to the Yellowstone Ice Cap to the north. There are two colors that are being shown here on this map. The pink color is the outline of the Yellowstone glacial system during the next to last ice age uh, or the penultimate glaciation. Locally, that's known as the Bull Lake glaciation and borrowing a term from an early report by Elliot Blackwelder from the Wind River Range to the Southeast there. So that's the outline of the Bull Lake or penultimate glaciation. And then the lighter color is the outline of ice coverage during the last ice age, um, the one that we know the most about. There are some other symbols on here. The blue contours are contours of the ice surface showing that it was at its thickest in the middle here, uh, right across the Yellowstone Plateau. The ice reached a thickness of about 1100 meters over a kilometer um, to the best of our estimation. So one thing that you might notice here is that there's an interesting pattern between how much ice was around during the Bull, the Bull Lake or penultimate glaciation versus the last glacial maximum, which is locally known here as the Pinedale glaciation. Again, a term borrowed from Elliot Blackwelder. It appears as though, and we actually know this very, um, very well from the field evidence that ice was actually a lot more extensive during the Bull Lake glaciation compared to the Pinedale. And in Jackson Hole, the entire valley uh, was filled with ice during the Bull Lake glaciation, um, which is not the case during the Pinedale. 
glaciation. So it, the Bull Lake goes further by about 50 kilometers um, than the Pine Dale. And also likewise, around the Western margins of the system, the Bull Lake system um, is actually much more extensive than the Pine Dale. On the north and the eastern parts of this system, though, you don't see any pink over here. So that actually means that the Pine Dale glaciers from the last glaciation, they got bigger and they, they were longer. Those glaciers were more extensive during the last ice age than the Bull Lake. So that's one big question that we have. Actually, we have two questions. When did that Bull Lake glaciation reach its maximum stage? Can we actually figure that out using numerical dating techniques? And what might explain this, this uh, apparent asymmetric pattern of Bull Lake versus Pine Dale ice? Uh, there was some shift that happened between the last two glaciations. Long before I came along, um, the, the way that glacial extents were, were dated uh, was to rely on um, mapping combined with relative dating criterion. So the lower photos here, I have two photos. One of these is a moraine crest, sort of a side view of a moraine crest on the other side of the west side of the Tetons. Uh, that's a Bull Lake moraine. And then we have a Pine Dale moraine there on the right, which is much sharper crested, has a lot more boulders on it. And those are the types of observations that allow early geologists to figure out which moraines were older than others. So they would look for, you know, how thick were the soils? Um, how many boulders were on those um, crests? Were they sharp crested or broad crested? Uh, the thought there is that moraines, they, sharp, they start up sharp crested and then be, they start to relax as they erode through time. A little bit later in the 1970s, it was actually a paper led by Ken uh, and colleagues um, that provided the first numbers, the first actual numerical ages of these moraines. And the technique used at the time, very cutting edge, was a combination of potassium argon dating, which is a radiometric dating technique, and obsidian hydration dating, which is a relatively, um, a very novel technique, not, um, not very widely applied. So I want to say a little bit more about the obsidian hydration dating technique because it's just so cool. <laughs> Um, and it was really cutting edge uh, in the 70s. Ken based his work, his early work, uh, with obsidian hydration, uh, hydration around West Yellowstone, and we just recently published more obsidian hydration data in the Ashton, Idaho area, in those two field areas. The idea here is that if you know the age of a, of a lava flow, and in this case it's, it's an obsidian, a high silica obsidian bearing flow, and that is dated with the potassium argon dating technique, you can then look for fractures in the obsidian on that flow of known age and measure the thickness of that rind. Now, what we're seeing here in this photo, those are cracks in obsidian. And you'll notice that all of the cracks look a little bit lighter in color. That's because the glass is devitrifying. It's actually hydrating. It's taking on molecular water. And the thickness of that hydration rind is growing through time. And if you measure the thickness of the rind, and, and you know how old the flow is, you know the rate at which that obsidian hydration uh, is actually expanding through time. There was a very fortuitous circumstance here in West Yellowstone. Glaciers flowed over this obsidian bearing flow and that actually caused more fracturing of the flow. And all of the obsidian pebbles that ended up in the glacial deposits, they themselves were fractured and they started to grow these hydration rinds. And so what Ken and his colleagues did is they measured very precisely the thickness of those hydration rinds, and then they, that equated that to an age because they knew the rate at which those um, hydration rinds were growing. And when that was done in these field areas, there were ages that came out of this. For the Bull Lake moraines, Ken got his, an age of 140,000 years ago, and that corresponds with marine isotope stage six, so a time when glaciers were at their largest, but the next to last glaciation, the penultimate. For the Pine Dale glaciation, Ken and his colleagues got an age of 30,000 years. So I'll ask you to try to remember those numbers as we go through um, this talk. Now, when I came along in the 90s, um, the big fancy new cutting edge dating technique was to use surface exposure dating using cosmogenic isotopes. Now, the way that this works uh, briefly is that <clears throat> The Earth is being constantly bombarded with radiation that's coming from galactic sources. Uh, essentially, when stars explode, they send off in all directions um, radiation composed of a lot of atomic and subatomic particles. 
When those particles strike molecules in the Earth's atmosphere, they start to break down into secondary particles and subatomic particles. So all these little symbols that you see here, those are protons, neutrons, electrons, muons, mesons, all kinds of particles. By the time that radiation gets to the surface of the Earth and starts striking rocks on the surface, it's composed primarily of neutrons. Those neutrons, when they strike atoms that are within the rock materials, they break them into two parts. That's called a spallation reaction. And they produce what we call cosmogenic isotopes. Cosmogenic because they're, they're actually produced from that cosmic radiation striking those target atoms. I have one of these isotopes in a green box here because this is the isotope we've been using um, most extensively here in Yellowstone to date surfaces. Uh, and that's produced when an oxygen atom in a rock is struck by a neutron. And we get an isotope of beryllium-10. Now, if we know the rate at which that beryllium-10 is being produced, what we can then do is we can go out in the field. We can collect rocks. We've actually been doing that here in Jackson this week. Um, and we can take them back to the lab, extract the beryllium, measure the concentration of beryllium, and divide by the production rate. And that gives us what we call an exposure age. So that age is not when the rock formed. It's not the crystallization age of the rock. It tells us how long that rock has been on the surface of the Earth exposed to that cosmic radiation. So that's what that cartoon is up here in the top. That's supposed to be a, that's not a chocolate chip cookie or anything. That is a, that is a moraine with boulders on top of it. The idea here is that glaciers released those boulders when that moraine was being produced. And that's the first time those boulders start to accumulate cosmogenic isotopes. So the clock starts ticking, so to speak. And then we go out and we collect rock from those boulders and we get an age of when that boulder was, rest, uh, was basically released from the glacier. So a couple of things to say about this. There are certainly, like all dating techniques, there are a lot of caveats and things we need to think about. One is that uh, geology happens. There's a lot of erosion out there and nature is imperfect and, at some and sometimes hard to interpret. Moraines, as I said before, looking at these same two photos, they degrade through time. So there's a lot of erosion. So those boulders may not have just been sitting there undisturbed uh, since they were released from the ice. They could roll around. Or if they were buried initially and the marine crest starts to erode and the soils start to erode and the surface lowers, those boulders could start emerging. Those are called, that's called boulder exhumation. If we try to date one of those boulders, it's gonna give us an age that's way younger than the moraine. The rock itself could be eroding. So some of that beryllium could be lost for that, for that process. Plus, this is a very snowy place, so if a boulder gets covered with snow, that might block some of the radiation, and we have to account for that when we interpret our exposure ages. There's also the possibility some boulders may have already been on the landscape, and then the glacier comes along, reincorporates it, redeposits it, and that boulder already accumulated isotopes from some prior history, and so it'll come out too old. But generally speaking, we, we pick a lot of boulders on a moraine. So we're not just looking at one age. We get maybe five or 10 from a single moraine. We look for outliers. And then we interpret the exposure age as the time when that moraine was last occupied by a glacier margin. So it's not the age of an ice advance. It's actually an age of ice retreat, or at least when that retreat from the moraine began. And that's important to keep in mind as we go through the talk. So I'm going to dive right into some of our results from this exposure dating technique. And as I said, this, is a, this was a newish technique in the 90s. It's now very widely applied um, in glaciated terrains and for many other applications uh, around the world. I'm going to zoom back in on the Bull Lake glaciation right here in Jackson Hole. And what Ken and I did is we looked for boulders that are right along that outermost limit of Bull Lake ice as that glacier tongue was flowing southward through Jackson Hole right around Munger Mountain, if you're familiar with, with that part of the world down there. And we found eight really large boulders that we thought were, they looked very stable and very suitable for this dating technique. And we come up with a beryllium 10 exposure age of 150 plus or minus 4,000 years. We published that number in 2008. And that was a really nice validation of the earlier work that Ken and colleagues did with obsidian hydration but we now know the number to much greater precision. 
So um, we also applied exposure dating to deposits from the last glaciation, which is the Pinedale glaciation. And those deposits are much more extensive, a lot more targets out there uh, to find. And we looked at outlet glaciers all around the margins of the glacial, uh, the greater Yellowstone glacial system. So I'm just gonna put some numbers up here and there are a lot of numbers here. Um, we have 200 or more in ages from Yellowstone, many exposure ages. This is one of the most densely dated uh, glacial systems in the Western US. Each one of these numbers that you're seeing here, like for example, uh, this one here for Pine Creek um, in the Paradise Valley, that's an average of many ex uh, boulder exposure ages uh, with the uncertainty. And that's an outlet glacier moraine. It's a terminal moraine. Now, if all of these glaciers reach their terminal positions at the same time, all around the greater Yellowstone glacial system, we would expect all these numbers to be right around the same, but they're not. So if you start looking more closely, you'll see that we have older ages generally in the north and the east and younger ages towards the south, including in the Tetons where we have ages in around 14, 15,000 years. So what that tells us is that not all of these, these glaciers did not all reach their maximum sizes and lengths at the same time. So there's an asynchrony here in the glacial maximum for the last glaciation. And not only that, it appears that the center of ice mass was migrating towards the southwest. Because of that, when you look at a map like this, it's actually pretty misleading because the ice coverage never actually looked like we're showing it in this figure. Uh, there's, it would have evolved through time with glaciers reaching their maximum first in the north and the east and glaciers reaching their maximum much later, thousands of years later in the Southern part of the system. So we published this, uh, these ages and we kind of punted on, on reconstructing what this may have looked like through time until more recently where Ken and I basically got together and we decided, you know what? We think we have enough information here from the dating and also from Ken's extensive mapping and, and the mapping of many others to put all of that together and try to reconstruct what this ice complex may have looked like through time, through the Pinedale. Can we do that? Before we could even write the paper, we had to come up with the reconstructions. So before I show you those, I'll show you the ages of these moraines just one more time. It might be a little more clear here. What you're looking at here are, this is a different way of showing the ages of the moraines. These are called, um, we call them camel plots uh, in the cosmogenic community because they look like camel humps but what they really are are probability density functions of these various moraine ages. And ages are, uh, you can see going from 24,000 to 10,000 along the x-axis. So th things are getting younger towards the right. And then the y-axis is, is a normalized probability. So the greater the peak, the greater the probability that that's the age of that moraine. The peak of these curves tends to be the, the greatest probability age. And you can see from this figure, if you stare at it long enough, that there are actually, there's some patterns here. They're certainly not all the same age, but what Ken and I did is we informally broke them into three phases, early, middle, and late um, moraines or phases of the Pinedale Glaciation in Yellowstone. So once we established those informal subdivisions of the last glaciation, we then set about the task of drawing the maps. And that turned out to be a very challenging but really fun uh, task just to, to see what this ice cap may have looked like as it evolved, evolved through time through these three phases. So this first map here is what we think the ice cap looked like during the early Pinedale from about 22 to 18,000 years ago. This is the middle Pinedale from 18 to 16. And then we have the late Pinedale from 16 to 13,000 years ago. So you can see there's a lot going on here as this ice cap evolved through time. And what I wanna do next here is sort of walk you through these, uh, each one of these and highlight a few of the, of the features that we um, interpreted to have occurred during these three phases based on the mapping and the dating. So let's start with the early Pinedale. The question here is how did the Yellowstone ice cap come to be? What did it look like when it, was, when it first started to grow when it was in its, its early years here? So what we think, and what, this is not just what we think, this is based on an enormous amount of geologic mapping and a lot of dating 
our interpretation is that the ice built up first in the highest mountain ranges, specifically in the Beartooth Uplift, which is the northern part here, and in the High Absarica Ranges here, um, further to the south. And that's maybe not surprising. The highest mountains are, are going to tend to capture ice first. But what's intriguing here is if you look at the Yellowstone Plateau itself, there's actually not much ice at all on the plateau. The plateau initially did not have ice on it because the elevation or the altitude of that plateau was not high enough to be above the snow line. So initially, there was no ice on the Yellowstone Plateau. We have some age control for when these events were happening by uh, from Clark's Fork uh, Terminal Moraines at the mouth of the Clark's Fork there on the uh, western edge of the Bighorn Basin. We get an age of about 20,000 years from those moraines. We also know uh, from the mapping that uh, we can look in the field uh, for indications of which direction the ice was flowing throughout these phases of the Pine Dale. And during the early Pine Dale, we had southwestward flow across the Washburn Range. And that ice formed a little, a little tongue here that dammed a lake in Hayden Valley. And we know that because there are lake sediments in the Hayden Valley that date to that time period. We also know that this was the time period when ice was advancing onto the plateau uh, into the area that became our modern day Yellowstone Lake. And there, those southern arms of Yellowstone Lake there, those fjord-like arms were, were carved during this early Pine Dale time. We also have ice further south, closer to home here in Jackson, uh, invading the northern part of Jackson Hole and Antelope Flats, coming from the High Absericas um, in a big lobe of ice that, that's called the Buffalo Fork Lobe because that was the main drainage that ice was flowing down. So that's the early Pine Dale. We have some age control as well in the Teton Range for isolated valley glaciers that date to this time period about 22,000 years ago. So I'm going to do this for, for each phase. I'll, sh I'll show some phases here. The next big event here is that the Yellowstone Plateau finally gets its ice cap during uh, the middle um, Pine Dale. And I just want to show you some field photos before I show you that map. This is a boulder resting on the crest of the Clark's Fork Terminal Moraine, a beautiful boulder with glacial polish, striations, so we don't worry about um, concerns about eroding uh, erosion of the rock surface. And it's about a meter, a little more than that tall. Tall boulders are good because they're tall and stable and they rise up above snow cover a little better than um, smaller boulders. We get an age from 10 boulders on this moraine that averaged to 20,000 years. This is what the moraine looks like um, in the Tetons. That This is one of the oldest moraines that we've dated in the Tetons uh, from the last glaciation dating to about 22,000 years ago. And this is a, a high lateral moraine between Bradley and Taggart Lakes, if you've ever been up there. So now we get to the middle Pine Dale. And the big event here, as I said, is we, we finally have the blooming of the Yellowstone Plateau ice cap. What we think happened is that ice that was flowing onto the plateau from the Beartooth uplift and the High Absericas, they started to thicken. And eventually the ice itself thickened to the point where it rose up above the, the Ice Age snow line. And that allowed um, what became a self-sustaining ice mass that built up on the plateau and eventually became the dominant ice, um, ice mass of this entire system. That started happening in the middle Pine Dale. As a result, we have a major shift in the direction of ice flow. Ice was flowing south from the Beartooth uplift, but now we have ice that's flowing in the opposite direction to the north, which is a pretty remarkable observation. This is um, a key line of evidence for this major shift in the evolution of the ice cap. And the evidence comes from striations, glacial scratches on Observation Peak, which is part of the Washburn Range. What you're looking at here on the left-hand side is a photomicrograph of striations. And what, you're, what you should be able to see here is that there are two sets of striations in different directions. There's a younger set, there's an older set. And we know that one set is younger and one set's older because they cut across each other. The younger striations cut across the older striations. And it's not quite a, a 180 reversal, but pretty close to it. And you can see on the right here, that's the photograph of these striations on Observation Peak. Ken published this in his original 1979 professional paper. And it's, it's really remarkable to be um, seeing a, a major shift, almost a 180 in ice flow direction based on uh, the striation evidence in the Washburn Range. That only could have happened if there was a major ice cap 
on the Yellowstone Plateau during the Middle Pine Dale. Getting back to the map here, um, we know the timing of when some of these events occurred by uh, terminal moraines and recessional moraines in Paradise Valley. Uh, those are dated to 18 to 17,000 years ago. Those moraines are, and that's an outlet glacier, the Northern Yellowstone Outlet Glacier uh, that was fed by ice from the Yellowstone Plateau. And that's, that's, the, that's basically the reason why so much ice ended up getting funneled down Yellowstone, uh, the Yellowstone River drainage uh, in Paradise Valley during the Middle Pine Dale. Curiously enough, in other parts of the ice system, we're starting to see major recession of glaciers, which might seem strange. How do you have uh, glaciers advancing in one part of the system and retreating in other parts of the system? Well, what we think was happening at this time is because of the Yellowstone Plateau ice cap, it formed its own mountain, so to speak. Instead of having a topographic mountain, um, in the land surface, we now have a mountain of ice. And so what that probably did is it would have basically been an obstacle for storms coming up the Snake River Plain. And on the downwind side of that blooming Yellowstone Plateau ice cap, there would have been a growing precipitation shadow. So that's actually ice recession related not to um, broader scale climate change, but because of shifting ice dynamics in the Yellowstone system. We also have recession of ice here in, in Jackson Hole at that time, the recession of the, the Buffalo Fork Lobe. That's a little bit more difficult to explain by um, precipitation shadow mechanisms, but we, we do think that it might be related to that. Finally, we get to the late Pine Dale. And here you can see that we now have a much um, larger ice cap that seems to be shifting towards the Southwest. And what we think is happening here is that the center of ice mass in the system was growing towards its moisture source, its primary moisture source, I should say. There's storms coming from all over, but many of them are coming from the Snake River Plain. This is the type of behavior that's been documented previously for large continental ice sheets that tend to grow towards major sources of moisture and snowfall. But as far as we know, this is one of the clearest documentations of a mountain glacier system uh, behaving similarly. As a result, we have ice that's advancing uh, to its terminal moraines near Ashton, Idaho. And we also have the Snake River lobe of ice that's flowing south uh, into the northern part of Jackson Hole at this time. And we have ages for that uh, for about 15.5 thousand years ago. The Teton Valley glaciers were also reaching their terminal moraines at this time, many of them. That age that you see there 15.2 thousand years ago is actually coming from the moraines that are enclosing Jenny Lake, an uh, iconic feature of Grand Teton National Park. And yet further in the north, we have evidence for ice stagnation. So all the way up near Gardner, Montana, we have moraines up there that are recording not an ice advance, um, but actually a stable position that records basically the diminishment of the Yellowstone Plateau ice cap. And I want to zoom into this area because there's some really, really cool features here uh, that are worth noting. So what I'm showing here is a series of terminal and recessional moraines. This green, this dark green horseshoe, that's the eight mile terminal moraine dated to about uh, 18,000 years ago with exposure dating. And then we have light green Chico moraines, recessional moraines that are about a thousand years younger. And then we have a big gap and the next time we see a, a moraine is in the Deckard Flats area here near Gardner, Montana, which is dated to 15.1. By that time, we think that the ice cap on the Yellowstone Plateau was no longer feeding this ice system. So we interpret it as ice stagnation. And then we have a couple of other features here, but I wanna zoom into a really curious feature here near the Deckard Flats margin, which is this feature. You're looking at an aerial photo that was taken, I think, in 1970 by John Shelton uh, before Paradise Valley was as developed as it is now. Uh, some of this actually lies in, uh, within the boundaries of Yellowstone National Park. And if you look at that scale bar, what you're looking at is an enormous, enormous flood bar. And on top of that flood bar, you can see these lines here and these ridges and swales. Those are interpreted as mega ripples. So this is interpreted as recording enormous glacial meltwater floods that were coming out of Yellowstone and, be, and really recording the last gasp of glaciation in Yellowstone. So if we can figure out the age of this flood bar, 
we're going to be dating the timing of that last gasp. And in fact, we get uh, an age here with some uncertainty, but around 14,000 years ago. Uh, so that fits in with all of the other marine ages that, we, that we've been talking about so far. So at this point, there's no ice on the plateau anymore, and um, there's probably widespread disintegration of the Yellowstone complex. Here's a field photo on those ripples, and that's Ken again explaining these huge, um, these huge boulders to um, at least initially incredulous uh, crowd of geologists who are trying to wrap their brains around how such a huge um, flood bar could have actually been deposited in the Paradise Valley. So it's kind of a fun story uh, with these flood deposits. So just to wrap that up, this is wrapping up the first part of my talk. Uh, we have three phases of the Pinedale Glaciation. There's the early and the middle and the late. So you can see that ice mass growing towards the southwest, towards its primary source of, mo source of moisture, uh, storm tracks along the Snake River Plain. OK, so at this point, um, I'm going to keep going. Uh, but I have the next part of my talk is going to be focused more specifically on the Teton Range. And, uh, and this is where I'll start talking a little bit more about the Teton Fault um, and other features that we're working on down here. As I said before, uh, when you're in Grand Teton and you're looking up at the mountains, it, you would, it's easy to, to think that all of the glacial features that you're seeing are coming from the Tetons and glaciers that used to be in those valleys. But look how small that ice is compared to Yellowstone. It's pretty small. Not to diminish the, the importance, though, we get some of our best preserved glacial features here in the Tetons, and we've been um, learning a lot. We're certainly not the first ones, nor is Ken. We have to go all the way back to um, the 1920s and 30s, um, where this is a report here by Fritjof Frixell. This is a, a rather famous uh, report that he published in 1930, which is essentially his PhD thesis. And he was really the first one to map uh, glaciers and glacial deposits in the Teton Range. And I'm, I'm very fortunate to own a copy of this. They're kind of hard to find, but if you can find one, it's, it's pretty cool. You can find sort of a distillation of what's in this report um, in later reports that you can get in the visitor centers here. The map that you see there on the right is just exquisite. I love this map. Um, all the different colors, the, the green that's showing the glaciers coming out of the easternmost part of the Teton Range and all of the yellows and oranges, those are outwash deposits uh, in Jackson Valley. So, so Frixell produced wonderfully detailed um, descriptions of many of the glacial features in Jackson Hole, but he did assume that most of these features were coming from the Tetons, which was later um, learned to be uh, not the case. But he certainly laid a pretty, a pretty extensive foundation for other geologists to build from. If we fast forward to modern times here, um, more recent developments, of course, a lot happened between 1930 and, um, and now. I just want to show um, a map of the Teton Fault and uh, Grand Teton National Park, pointing out the fact that we now have full LIDAR coverage of the entire national park. And that was made available um, in 2015. And what you're looking at here, it doesn't really do the LIDAR justice, but I'll, I'll show you more detailed close-ups later. But uh, it's, it's hard to overstate how, uh, how much of a game changer it is to have LIDAR covering the entire national park. If you're a geomorphologist and you're, you're interested in landforms, this is, um, this is a gold mine. And it's really um, instigated a lot of more recent research um, on all aspects of the, the geologic history of the Tetons. I'm sure we'll be seeing the same sort of thing happening when um, Yellowstone is fully covered by LIDAR as well. The map that you're actually seeing here was published in 2019, and this was focused on the Teton Fault specifically. This was one of many uh, uh, geologic features that was highlighted by the LIDAR, and this was published by my colleagues Mark Zellman, Chris Ross, and Glenn Thackeray in 2019. And you can see it's not one continuous line, or maybe you can't, it's kind of hard to see, but we, we have a lot of details um, in that main trace of the Teton Fault, thanks to um, the work of, of Zellman, Duras, Thackeray, um, and their colleagues. So now I'm going to show you some close-ups, and this, uh, some of this is really just for fun to show how cool the LIDAR is. But this is an oblique view of the Tetons, and this is Jenny Lake here in the foreground, Grand Teton there in the middle. And if I melt that into the LIDAR, and we have the LIDAR draped over the, over the topography here, you can start to see just some wonderful details um, in the land surface. 
And this is LiDAR that's been processed to remove all the tree cover. So you can basically see the bare earth here. And just as one example of how cool this is, you can now see right through the trees and you see many different ridges enclosing Jenny Lake. Those are the Jenny Lake moraines. So it's not just one ridge, it's actually a whole bunch of ridges. And we knew that already from our geologic mapping, but to see it all stripped bare and shown in this level of detail is, is just really cool. The other big feature here to point out is, well, maybe you can already see it. There's this, look, looks like a big uh, gap or uh, some sort of fracture that's running through the field of view here. And if I highlight that with red, that is in fact the trace, the main trace of the Teton Fault. Uh, and I'm generalizing here because as you saw in that previous map, it's, there's a lot more details to just one line across the map here. A key field observation here is that this fault is cutting across many of the previously mapped glacial features in the Teton Range. And that's the focus of the next um, part of my talk here. But before I do that, I wanna just go over the Teton Fault and a little bit of background. Um, if you've been tuning into um, other talks here given by other folks in this talk series, you probably have already heard some of this. And this is really just some review here on the Teton Fault. So this is a major range bounding fault. It's a normal fault. It's dipping towards the east. It's about 72 kilometers long. And there's a whole series of publications here that I'm citing here. This is not complete um, by any means, but there's been a lot of previous work on the Teton Fault that we're building from. Uh, that said though, there is also some, um, there's, I, I'm not sure if I wanna call them disagreements, but there's various interpretations of the history of the Teton Fault. So there's a lot more to learn about the history of the fault. For example, you can see published estimates of the total amount of offset along this fault ranging from six to nine kilometers since the fault initiated between five and 13 million years ago. I tend to think it's probably on the younger end of that range. Um, and if you just do some simple math here, that implies a long-term slip rate of about 0.5 to 1.2 meters per thousand years um, along that fault. Slip rates are of keen interest because slip rates are happening because of earthquakes and earthquakes constitute a major geologic hazard. So the more that we know about this fault, the better positioned we are gonna to be to understand the hazards that are involved in um, living and recreating so close to a major fault. The offset pattern of the Teton Fault is, is pretty interesting. It sort of mimics the topography. The greatest amount of offset, at least visible on the landscape uh, today, ranges from near 30, 30 meters uh, near the central part of the fault trace. And in fact, um, just earlier today, we, we hiked up that fault face. Uh, the, and that was, that's a difficult thing to do, um, but it's, it's worth the effort to, to get a good gander at that, at that fault scar. When you go to the north and to the south, you, that total amount of offset peters out and then you no longer see the fault. There are some, um, there's, there's growing, um, growing lines of evidence that are constraining uh, slip rates. Um, and there's, there's a whole bunch of papers here. This is again, not complete, but those slip rates have, um, they range in the published literature from about 0.3 to 1.5 meters per thousand years. So if you actually compare that uh, to the long-term um, slip rates, they, they are in this, a similar range. The last point here is that there's been some very interesting modeling work that's been done on the Teton Fault, which predicts that the glaciers, the, the glaciation in this region is actually interacting with the fault, such that the slip rates along the fault are predicted by the, by the modeling work here led by Andrea Hampel and her colleagues to be slower during times of glacial loading and faster when that load is released uh, during deglaciation. And I should point out here that in their model, uh, we're really talking more about the, the thick ice that was to the north in Yellowstone, loading and unloading the landscape and affecting slip rates along the Teton Fault. The valley glaciers in the Tetons may have played a role as well. They probably did, but they, they are a, a less, they're a smaller player in the story because it wasn't as much ice. So a few years back, um, we got funded by the National Science Foundation to investigate the Teton Fault and take a deeper dive into its geologic history. And I'm working on this project with, uh, with colleagues, some of whom have given talks in this 
in this Geologists of Jackson Hole talk series. My role in this project is to directly date landforms that have been cut by the fault uh, using exposure dating, the technique we've already been using to date glacial features. Uh, Darren Larson, whom I think many of you know, um, who uh, his family lives here locally, and he's, he's given talks in this, um, in this talk series, he's been looking at the lakes. And I think at this point, Darren has probably cored every single lake in the Tetons, and I've been fortunate to be along on a lot of those trips. Um, and it's uh, what, those lake sediments, I'm not going to go over Darren's work, but um, he's looking at disturbance layers in the lake sediments, each of which is interpreted to record a major seismic event that is related to um, fault motion. And you'll see more of that, I would assume, coming out um, in the literature. And there's already some nice papers that Darren's led uh, that you can read about that story. The other part of this um, project is to look at trenches that are dug across the fault trace. And that's being led by Glenn Thackeray, Mark Zellman, Chris Ross, and their colleagues. Some of these trenches are hand dug. Um, Glenn calls them artisanal because we can't be bringing big backhoes into the national park to dig across the fault. Although that is possible when you're outside the fault boundary. And um, that's, that's work that's been led by the USGS, Chris Ross and his colleagues uh, further south. And the idea there is if you can dig a trench a few meters down and expose the fault and see what it looks like below the surface, you could actually start to identify slip events in those trenches. And many consider paleoseismic trenches to be the gold standard of looking at um, fault activity and trying to reconstruct events. But what we're doing is we're putting all of these lines of evidence together into a more comprehensive and integrated history of the, of the Teton Fault. So I'm going to zoom in here, and I'm going to really only talk about my role in this work, which again is uh, to be dating landforms cut by the Teton Fault. So I'll zoom into that blue box here and start with Google Earth uh, base map. So you might see some features you recognize here. There's Jenny Lake right there. There's Phelps Lake and all this greenery here. Those are, those are moraines, um, and you can see the peaks here. So this is a layer that's showing the Pleistocene ice cover. And this is ice cover that's um, really um, with reference to the last glacial maximum. So the Pinedale glaciation is what you're seeing here. You might note that some of the, uh, some of the valley glaciers coming out of the Tetons were coalesced with each other. But the big ice to the north here and off of this map frame, that's Yellowstone ice. And that didn't coalesce with uh, the glaciers coming out of the Tetons until you get to the area around Lee Lake here, where we think there, we know from the field evidence that valley glaciers um, occupying Lee Lake um, were, co were co coalesced with the Yellowstone ice. So just to move on here, that red line that you see there, that's the trace of the Teton Fault. And I, I basically reproduced that directly from um, the Zellman and others map uh, that was published in 2019. All of the other lines that you see here in blue and purple, those are moraines. So these blue ones, those are terminal moraines. And the purple ones, if you can see those, those are lateral moraines. You can see that the fault is cutting across at least some of these moraines. So what we've been doing with exposure dating is we've been collecting a lot of boulders in the Tetons. Um, I, I feel like we've probably collected most of the best ones, at least in my view, from these um, moraine crests on the east side. So everywhere you see a yellow dot, is a moraine boulder that we've collected uh, rock from for exposure dating. The green dots are also important. Those are from glacially scoured bedrock up the valleys. And those are important to our story as well because I explained how we, how we date moraine boulders and how we interpret them as the timing of when the ice starts to retreat from that moraine crest. If you sample bedrock and you develop an exposure age from bedrock, what you're, the event that you're dating is the time that that rock surface was uncovered and revealed by ice retreat. So if we sample ice scoured bedrock up, of the, up these valleys, we can then track when the glaciers were retreating up the valley. And we want to know that because we want to know how fast these glaciers retreated from their terminal positions. So we're putting all of this together uh, into uh, a chronology of glaciation in the Teton Range. And some of this has been published and some of this has not. Um, we, the earliest work that we did was to focus on the Jenny Lake Moraines because they are so exquisite. And we collected boulders along the terminal moraines that are enclosing the lake. And we get 
ages, there's there's ridges, but there's really two groups of ridges. So it's, there's moraines that we call the inner Jenny Lake moraines and the outer Jenny Lake moraines. The outermost are distal Jenny Lake moraines. They date to 15.2 thousand years ago. So that's consistent with what I've been saying before. That's an age of regional deglaciation, but it appears to be when that ice started to retreat from the outer Jenny Lake moraines. And then there's some inner Jenny Lake moraines that are recessional and they date to 14.4. And then we have some bedrock uh, dated in Cascade Canyon. And then we have boulders perched on a cirque lip up at Lake Solitude dating to about 13,000. So we put all of that together and we can, we can track the timing of ice retreat. We get the age of the maximum, uh, the terminal moraines. So when the ice started to retreat from the terminal moraines. And so that's a lot of, a lot of useful information. But that's all we did initially. Later on, I started thinking, you know, we should probably see what the ages of the moraines for the other Teton Valley glaciers might turn out to be. Maybe Jenny Lake is an anomaly. Um, we want to maybe see if there's any difference in the ages of terminal moraines north and south along the Tetons. So we did just that. And what you're looking at here, these are averages of terminal moraines. But what we did later was a little bit different. Instead of dating just terminal moraines, we also climbed up the lateral moraines and we dated boulders along those lateral moraines. And those moraines are shown in purple and the ages that we got from those moraines are shown in purple. Now, initially when I started getting ages in the twenties from those boulders, I thought, well, that those are outliers. That's too old, that doesn't make sense. They're way, too, they're way older than all the terminal moraine ages that we dated so far. But then a trend started to appear. And as you can see here in Glacier Gulch, we have 22,000 years, about 22 at Bradley Lake. And then again, for a lateral moraine in Phelps Lake, about 19. So major, um, the, the newsworthy outcome of this is that the high lateral moraines are actually several thousands of years older than the terminal moraines, which is, was not what we were anticipating when we started doing this project. And I'll tell you why that's important. It's important because if we want to start using these landforms to constrain slip rates along the Teton Fault, we need to know the age of the, of the landform that's being cut by the fault. So I'm going to zoom in here to Glacier Gulch, Bradley Lake, Taggart Lake, and I'm going to melt this into the LIDAR. And what you can see here very clearly from the LIDAR is that there are at least five places here where we have high lateral moraines that are being cut by the Teton Fault. So the fault is not cutting the terminal and recessional moraines that we've dated to 15,000 and had previously assumed all of these moraines were probably about that age. They're cutting the high lateral moraines. And that was kind of a breakthrough for us because those moraines are actually a lot older than we were expecting them to be. So let me give you a couple of examples here of what these look like in the field. It's really pretty striking when you're, when you're hiking around and if you're crawling up one of these lateral moraines and this one happens to be the, the right lateral moraine or the moraine that's on the south side of Taggart Lake, you, you'll be climbing up this crest here and then you'll get to a very steep section. So there's an inflection in topography and then you continue on your merry way above that inflection. And what, you're, what you've just done is you've climbed up the Teton fault scarp. So what you're looking at here is a very clear cutting of the Teton Fault Scarp. Remember the Teton Fault is dipping to the east. The actual angle that we see on the Fault Scarp is probably not the same as the actual uh, fault plane because of geomorphic um, erosion. But in any case, it's very easy to identify where that fault is in the field. Now the idea here, the simplistic idea at least, uh, the starting point is that if we can figure out how old this moraine is, with exposure dating. And we can then measure or survey the amount of offset along that fault. We have a, uh, the amount of offset, we have an age, and we can turn that into a time integrated uh, open slip rate, or at least an offset rate. So that's what we've been trying to do um, in places where we can, uh, where we have enough data to do it. So once more, we'll look at the Eastern range front here of the Tetons. We'll melt that into the LIDAR. There's the main trace of the fault. Again, that's highly generalized. It's not a single trace as we know from more detailed mapping. But you can see that 
it's cutting across many of these lateral moraines, and those lateral moraines have been our targets for exposure dating. And we've dated pretty much most of the major high laterals at this point. The only exception here being, well, we actually have we have ages from the from this one here as well, um, just north of Bradley Lake. Our objective was to be collecting ages above and below the fault scarp uh, to, to make sure that we're looking at the same landform and also to see if those ages are any different. And as I said, we also have ages on the bedrock. If any of you have been up to Delta Lake, that that seems to be the hot new trail. <laughs> it, I don't, it's not official yet, but it seems like it's destined to be. Um, when you're up there, you have the opportunity to go down a different way and you can go down that um, nice glacially sculpted bedrock along Glacier Gulch and we've collected samples there for exposure dating. Um, and I'm not showing you all the ages here. Um, they're not all published yet, but we're, we're gonna be getting those out um, very soon. So let me zoom into really one of the best examples that we have here, which is a medial moraine between Taggart Lake and Bradley Lake, where we have a lot of boulders that we've dated above and below that fault scarp. So here's a view, it's sort of looking towards the, sort of an oblique view looking towards the north. So this is using the LIDAR again, there's Taggart Lake, there's Bradley Lake, and all these yellow dots with the numbers next to them, those are individual moraine boulders that we've dated with exposure dating. The age that we get above the fault, uh, they range in the low 20s. And then there's an intermediate age that we see uh, just below the fault scarp. And then we have ages that are clustered right around 15,000 years as we get lower down. That moraine that you see there above the fault scarp, you can walk right to the edge of that scarp and it's fairly cleanly cut by the fault. So we feel confident that that landform was cut by this fault scarp. And then further down, um, we have ages that average around 15, as I said. The surveyed uh, vertical offset along this fault scarp here is 26.8 meters. And that's actually a number that uh, I took from a paper that was published by uh, Glenn Thackeray and his student Amy Staley in 2017. But also interestingly, when you're down in the valley, you can see outwash that is on the valley floor that is also offset by the fault, but not as much. There, if you're hiking through here and fighting your way through the bush, you will measure a vertical offset of about 12.4 meters. So we can, we can do a little bit of, um, we can take some initial early stabs here at what this can tell us about fault slip rates. So this is highly generalized, but if we assume or interpret this moraine up here as being the feature that's cut by this fault, and that the age of that landform averages to about 22,000 years, that 22,000 year landform, 22,000 year old landform, has been offset 26.8 meters since 22,000 years ago. And that translates to an offset, a vertical offset rate of 1.2 meters per thousand years. And I'm being careful, careful here, or trying to be careful to not call this a slip rate, because if we wanna turn this into a slip rate, we need to know the fault geometry and a lot of other information. In any case, if we look at the valley and we sort of play that same game, we know when this valley was deglaciated, that's where these ages come in and why they're important. They tell us that the recessional moraines where we're down, they date to about 15,000 years ago. That's when the ice retreated up valley, exposed what we now know as Taggart Lake. So these 15,000 year old deposits, they have to be 15,000 years or younger. They're offset by 12.4 meters over the last 15,000 years. So that's a slip rate of 0.8 meters per year. However, we could take this one step further because we can look at the amount of offset that occurred between 22 and 15,000 years ago. And that turns out to be 14.4 meters. That's just 26.8 minus 12.4. And that's an interval of 7,000 years. And if we do that, that gives us a slip rate over that time interval of 22 to 15,000 years of 2.1 meters per thousand years. If that's where we stopped, the interpretation would be that it appears that slip rates were faster, or I should say offset rates were faster uh, between 22 and 15,000 years ago. And since 15,000 years ago, on average, they've been a bit slower. 
Now, if we compare this to some earlier work, and I'm um, comparing this to the Granite Creek Trench, which was published um, by uh, Bird and also other papers um, that Bob Smith was involved in, they didn't have the same exact time intervals as us, but they, they saw a similar thing. 15 to 8,000 years ago, they calculated an offset rate of 1.5 meters per thousand years. And since 8,000 years ago, a slip rate of 0.5 meters per thousand years. So it begs the question, do, do these varying slip rates through time, first of all, is that real? And second of all, does that have, can we relate that to glacial loading and unloading? And I've been hinting that it's not nearly this simple, it's, it's much more complicated. So uh, if we wanna dive in deeper and I won't linger on this too long, but um, my postdoctoral colleague, Aliyah Lesnick, um, she presented a poster on this at the GSA meeting last year, where she started taking into account the, the complexities of trying to do what we're trying to do. Uh, it's not as simple as surveying a fault scarp height, getting a landform age and doing some division because all of these measurements that we're making have some uncertainty. There are uncertainties in the exposure ages. There are uncertainties in exactly how much vertical separation there is. And that's what this figure is showing. These moraines are not super smooth. They actually have some irregularity to them. And in fact, many of them have these slumped regions just below the fault scarp. And that's because of antithetic faulting that, caused that causes that to slump down. So what Aaliyah was trying to do is to incorporate all of those uncertainties um, into a more refined measure of vertical offset. And that's work that is ongoing. And this is only one example of what we might be able to do if we start considering the greater details and complexities of this work. But um, in that, uh, with that, I'm gonna wrap up because I wanna save enough time for Q&A. And I'll just leave you with some summary highlights of, of our work here. Getting back to the earlier part of the talk, we have uh, combined mapping and exposure dating evidence for three phases of the Pinedale glaciation, the last glaciation in greater Yellowstone. So we have our three phases from 22 to 18, 18 to 16, 16 to 13. Um, and that's, uh, we, we suspect that if we had the level of detail and mapping and dating that we do here in Yellowstone, we might see similar subdivisions of the, of the Pinedale and other Western US mountain ranges, but that is still to be determined. The center of mass of the Greater Yellowstone Glacial System, that's what the GYGS stands for, was building southwestward towards its primary moisture source. Uh, that would be storms coming up the Snake River Plain. And we think that um, there was a lot of orographic precipitation and also precipitation shadows that explained shifting ice dynamics during the Pine Dale. And all of that would be superimposed upon the greater regional forcing of these glaciers uh, due to climate change since the last ice age and during the last ice age. We have preliminary evidence for Teton fault offset rates that seem to be faster earlier on, followed by slower rates uh, since 15,000 years and on into the Holocene. And we already know more about this than I'm telling you because papers are coming out and emerging, uh, particularly on the Holocene record here. So this suggests some dynamic links with glacial loading and unloading, but that is gonna be, uh, that it's gonna be challenging to tease apart. As far as where, where we go next, well, we still have plenty of work to do. We have papers to write. We have a lot of evidence that we wanna combine from the glacial evidence, from the lake records that Darren Larson has been uh, leading, from the trench work that Glenn Thackeray and Mark Zellman, Christy Ross and many others um, are working on. And Aliyah has been also, Aliyah Lesnick uh, is part of this work as well, uh, looking at some of the finer details of fault slip and also uh, the time of glaciation. In fact, she's probably out in the field right now, um, swinging a hammer. <laughs> so I'll end with an acknowledgement slide here. Um, there's a, a long list of collaborators. This is by no means complete. Um, in uh, John's introduction, he mentioned, I've been working here for a long time. And uh, that's true. I, I started working here as a graduate student and then as a postdoc, and I continue to find new and interesting questions to work on here. We also have uh, generous support from funding sources. The National Science Foundation has been very generous in supporting this work, as has been the National Park Service and the University of Wyoming. And then my final slide is, uh, I'll just close with a slide again of, of Ken Pierce here on the Clarks Fork Moraine. This, uh, this was us doing field work together in 2003. And it's really, it's really impossible to overstate how, how important Ken was to me as a colleague and a mentor and a friend, and I, I will miss him. <laughs>
And um, with that, I will, I'll stop and, and be happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, Joe, thank you so much. This has been an absolutely amazing and stunning talk. The photos, the graphic work that you did, I, I'm getting lots of comments on how incredible and the amount of work that you put into this and, and the level of detail. So uh, thank you from our, our entire audience. We have a lot of questions, uh, <laughs> as you might imagine. So one of them is, why do you use the beryllium uh, isotope as opposed to the other isotopes that might also be produced by cosmic radiation? And as part of that question, since there's, since the spalling also happens in the upper atmosphere, how do you account or how do you subtract out beryllium that may have rained down onto the rock since exposure? Okay, that is a, that is a, a really good and a very insightful question. So beryllium 10 is produced in the atmosphere and it's produced in the rocks. And we separate those two sources of beryllium very carefully in the lab. The beryllium 10 that's produced in the atmosphere is what we, we tend to call that meteoric beryllium 10. We don't want that in our sample. We need to remove that and separate that from what we consider to be the cosmogenic beryllium 10 that was produced in the rocks themselves. And the chronometer that we're using relies on the beryllium 10 produced in the rocks. So I won't bore you with the details of our lab work. I love doing lab work, but basically when we get a rock from the field and in the Tetons, most of that rock is granitic. That means that it has quartz in it. And that means a lot of SiO2. So there's a lot of oxygen targets in that quartz. The development of this technique, it goes way back, but um, quartz was the focus of early exposure dating studies using beryllium 10 because we have very simple chemistry to deal with and we can purify the quartz. Quartz is very resistant to most chemical processes. And we take that rock through many different, um, many different and pretty aggressive quartz uh, uh, chemical etchings. And that etching is going to remove the outer portions of those grains. And it's also going to get rid of all of the beryllium 10 that may be in the rock due to meteoric sources. So, and we measure, we can, we can track that in the lab. We know when we've gotten rid of the beryllium 10 from meteoric sources um, through a series of etchings. So we end up with very pure quartz. Um, and beryllium 10 is a sort of a favorite isotope among many folks who use exposure dating because the production rate is known pretty well and that's important. The exposure age that you get is only as accurate as your knowledge of the rate at which it's being produced. The concentration part, that part of the problem has been, um, is in very good shape. We have accelerator mass spectrometers that can give us concentrations to the sub percent, uh, which is really nice that the analytical precision is, is it far exceeds all of the other, um, and it's, it's way better than all the other uncertainties we have from geology. I should mention though, and I won't, I won't go on too long. I could talk about cosmogenic isotopes all day. We have also used another isotope in Yellowstone, helium-3, Helium-3 is also produced in rock surfaces by spallation, but instead of using quartz, we separate out the olivine uh, minerals from basalt. And we have the fortune in Paradise Valley, for example, to have glacial boulders that are basalt. They've been quarried from some of the earliest volcanics um, in Paradise Valley um, shortly after the arrival of the Yellowstone hotspot. So the glacial deposits in uh, the Paradise Valley have both basalt and granitic rocks in them. And that's really nice because we can compare two different isotopes to each other. And we essentially get ages that agree with each other. So it gives us more confidence. Uh, <clears throat> do you have dates for earlier glacial events? The 2.5 million year Pleistocene period had numerous events here. Obviously newer ones, obscure older ones, but can you talk about any of the older ones? 
Not really. <laughs> so the, the reason is that e each successive glaciation tends to wipe out a lot of evidence, not all, but a lot of evidence that was left on the ground by previous glaciations. Um, you make a good point, or the, whoever asked that question makes a very good point. During the Pleistocene, we have repeated glaciations. It would be very misleading for me to leave you with the impression from this talk that there's only been two glaciations in Yellowstone. That's not true. There's been many, 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 many glaciations. We know very, very little about the earlier glaciations. There are other Western US mountain ranges uh, in Colorado, for example, where we have some moraines and some evidence from older stages. Here, we have limited but enough evidence of the Bull Lake glaciation, which was the next to last glaciation. And you, as I showed, there's deposits from the Bull Lake that that went further than the Pine Dale, so they didn't get overrun, which is really fortunate because it means that we're actually able to study them in detail here. That's not true in many other Western US mountain ranges, but there's parts of Yellowstone where we don't even see anything from the Bull Lake because the Pine Dale glaciation has completely overridden those deposits. That's true in the North, the Northern part of Yellowstone, the Northern Outlet glaciers coming off the Beartooths and the Absaricas up there. There's no Bull Lake, there's very little Bull Lake. So it's a, it's a well-known problem in glacial geology. The record that we see is we get these little snapshots of glaciations and it's like, you know, the analogy of like looking through a telescope the wrong way, the further back you look, the less you know about what you're looking at. Uh, it's certainly true for glaciations. We're not getting a complete record from the moraines. Uh, have there, were there likely to have been those large floods that you described to the north of Yellowstone through the Jackson Hole Valley as well. And can you talk about them? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So there were glacial floods that were happening in various uh, part regions around the margin, the periphery of, of the Yellowstone glacial system. I don't know of any beautifully preserved mega ripples and flood bars like that, you know, that John Shelton photo is a, is a classic. Um, we don't have features like that that are preserved in Jackson Hole, but there were certainly uh, glacial floods that were coursing down the Snake River and other drainages as the ice was retreating very rapidly to the north from the Yellowstone system. The deposits in this part of Jackson and the, the details can be found in the, in the professional paper that, that Ken led in 2018. Um, there's a lot of outwash in, in this. The Jackson Hole and Antelope Flats is just choked with with um, deposits and that tends to obscure some of the other features. The flood deposits are younger though, so you should still see them and you do. Um, but I would say that they are um, relative to the flood deposits in the north, they're, they're not as intensely studied, but they're certainly there. And if you look elsewhere and other um, major outlet glaciers coming off of Yellowstone, you see the same thing, you'll see, you'll see flood deposits. But those beautiful mega ripples, um, that's, that's really, and, and all throughout Northern Yellowstone, the deposits there are just, they're just gorgeously preserved. Yeah, no, they're, they're <clears throat> striking. Uh, most of the curves you had, the cosmogenic curves had double humps on them. Can you talk about the significance of that? Absolutely. So when you have a camel plot, which is really a probability expression of the age of a moraine, if, if it's a nice single hump, that gives you confidence that you have a tight, coherent set of ages and that that moraine ridge, the retreat age that you get from the exposure ages is probably recording a single retreat event from that crest. If you get two humps and you usually, it, it's not, it, well, I don't wanna say that we don't like it when we get two humps, it gives us more information. <laughs> Um, but if you get two humps, it means that you have an age distribution that is not Gaussian, it's maybe bimodal. And each one of those peaks in probability might correspond to a phase of marine construction or at least a phase of marine uh, abandonment. And it's actually pretty common to get uh, a couple of humps, uh, sometimes more than two on a marine. So you get bimodal, polymodal age distributions and the, the common interpretation is that you're seeing more than one event. Or it could also mean that a moraine is formed, the glacier retreats from the glacier, so the older set of 
the, the older hump records that initial retreat, and then the glacier readvances, reoccupies that moraine crest, drops a few more boulders, and so you get another hump, which is the younger hump, and then it retreats. So in that case, you would interpret it as basically a reoccupation of that moraine before final retreat. Uh, <clears throat> one of our listeners wants to know, where is that uh, 30 meter offset that you hiked up today? Uh, and were you caught in the thunderstorm? Almost. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, so the, the greatest scarp heights are found right along the central part of the range. And it's not a coincidence that that's where the highest mountains are. That's where the greatest amount of total offset has occurred along the Teton Fault. And it there, thereby stands for region, reason that the, the more recent events that have created the scarps that we still see preserved, uh, those scarps are going to be higher in that central part of the range. The highest scarps are found between um, generally between Taggart Lake and, and Jenny Lake, kind of in, in that region. And we've, we've crawled around, we've, we've crawled around all those scarps. Um, today we were, we were north of Jenny Lake and, um, you know, there's, it, it looks so easy when you're seeing it from a distance, but then you're on the ground and you're just like, you know, you're grabbing the willow and you're just trying to like, you know, sort of pull yourself up the scarp. It's not, I think it's fun, but it's also, it, it can be hard work if you got a heavy pack on. Yeah. yeah. With lots of rocks and hammers. Yes. <laughs> and a lot of rocks and tools and chisels. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, can you talk about the Timbered Island Moraine, uh, how it was formed, its age? Uh, it, it's a very interesting feature there. Yeah, it's really, it's, well, it sticks out like a sore thumb in, in Jackson Hole. So to the best of what we can we can tell, and I really should say that this is based on mapping by Ken Pierce and John Good. Um, that island is really, it, it was an island that was a little bit higher than the level of glacial outwash during the Pinedale glaciation. So it very likely dates to the Bull Lake glaciation. And in fact, on the northern side of that patch of that timbered island, there are boulders. And we've never We've never tried to date them, but I would suspect that they're they're older than the Pinedale, that maybe an earlier Pinedale phase, maybe the Bull Lake. That's really just, that's sort of speculation. But for whatever reason, that island was, uh, that sort of escaped uh, inundation by later outwash that was built up very thickly in the valley during the Pinedale glaciation. It's, um, it's sort of the glacial equivalent of a kapuka where you have like some landform that sort of rises above a lava flow and it escapes inundation by lava. Um, but I mean, that's sort of how I think about it. But the other thing to consider here is that the thickness of outwash varies across Jackson Hole and the direction or the source direction of that outwash changed through time. In the early Pinedale, most of this was coming, most of the outwash was coming from the high of Zerica's to the east down the Buffalo Fork. Um, and then that sort of shifted to Pacific Creek and then finally the Snake River itself. And the outwash packages are, they're wedge shaped. So they're gonna thin as you get further and further away from their source. So maybe because of the way that that source region was shifting through time, that thinner feathered edge of the outwash just basically never got thick enough to bury Timbered Island. But some of that speculation, but some of it's also based on the really careful mapping that, that Ken and John did. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Teton fault questions. Uh, can you uh, delineate the northern and southern end of the fault for us? And can you talk about when you think movement on the fault initiated? Um, that's that's a really great question. We uh, we really can't the, the work that we're doing really we can't comment on the initiation of fault movement because that it we're what we're looking at are very recent deposits. So we're really only looking at the geologic evidence for the most recent uh, slip events along that fault. So at least from the exposure dating that I'm doing and the trenches that are being dug and the and the lake sediments that Darren is looking at, these are all recording recent events. Um, primarily during and since the last glaciation. 
going further back in time requires different techniques. And there are other groups that are working on those questions, um, many other groups, actually. So I can't really comment on the initiation of the fault. As far as the segmentation of the fault, that's another big question. Um, as you can see from that beautiful map that uh, was published a couple of years ago, it's not one single line across the landscape. So there's a lot of questions about whether different portions of the fault are moving at different rates and by different amounts, maybe even because of different mechanisms. When we date a moraine that's cut by the fault, we're really only learning about specifically that part of the fault that's cutting that landform. So it, again, it's a, it's a snapshot. It's a, it's a geographic snapshot of what's happening, happening in that part of the fault. We've been targeting uh, landforms primarily that are near the central part of the range where the fault scarps are really high. Um, so they're all pretty close to each other and they're probably on interrelated parts of the fault. But we also have evidence that's much further to the south. Um, the trench, for example, that was dug by the USGS group led by Christy Ross and others was near Teton Village. And there the, the offset is much less. Um, and that might be, you know, what's happening down there might be quite different from what's happening further to the north. So it's not uh, a complete answer, but that's because we don't have all the information. Yeah. So <clears throat> when, when I hike around the Tetons, specifically, say, on the back side of the tram, I walk over very small moraines that are very high in the mountains. And I'm sort of assuming that these are little ice age moraines that, I mean, they're only 10 feet high or so, and they're very high up. They're at 10,000 feet. Is that a good interpretation? Well, so there is some historical accounts of when the glaciers were at some of these really high prominent moraines. Uh, the classic iconic example would be the huge, huge moraine in front of the Teton Glacier. And it's, I'm not sure if you stood on that crest before, but it's just, you know, that's just a stunning feature. And there's, a, there's another one close by and then there's moraines down the valley from there. Um, the ones you're describing, I think you're probably talking about some of the smaller moraines that are up in the, in the cirques. Yes. Um, yeah, so they're the not cirque below the tram. Well, yeah, um, it's a reasonable first instinct to think that those are all from what we call the Little Ice Age. Um, it would be nice to date them directly using the techniques that we've been applying to the older moraines. And in fact, we did collect some samples from the moraine on the Teton Glacier. All I'm gonna say is it didn't work out so well, so we're gonna try again. Um, when you get to features that are that young, you're really starting to push the young age limit of some of these exposure sure. dating techniques. Um, other workers have used lichenometry to try to date these moraines, but that, that can also be very tricky and doesn't always work out so well. So there aren't a lot of uh, available dating techniques for features that young. So in other ranges where we have successfully dated moraines that young, and that's actually work I've done, not so much here, but in South America and Peru, we have gotten ages from those moraines that are reliable, um, you know, plus or minus 10%. Um, and they're only 200 years old, which is just astounding. Wow. But we have the advantage there of those moraines being much higher in altitude. And I didn't mention this when I was explaining exposure dating, but the higher up you go, the higher the production rate because you're above more of the atmosphere and there's less blocking of cosmic rays. Sure. So these moraines here, they're, um, you know, they're, they're not nearly as high as the, the ones in Peru that have worked out well for us. So, but yes, yeah, so for good first instinct to think that those moraines are probably from the Little Ice Age, but it would have to be verified. Uh, so I, I'm sure there will be more questions that we'll be emailing you, but I would like to read uh, two comments from our president, uh, John Wallot. Clearly one of the best talks that we have ever had with outstanding graphs and figures, very clear presentation, incredibly informative. In addition, thank you for your comments on the work that Ken Pierce and John Good did for all of us in the Valley. They were great geologists and we were all blessed to know them. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I can't say how much of a privilege it was to be able to work with Ken for uh, a couple, you know, decades. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. And we were very fortunate to have him lead a field trip here for us to talk about the glaciology and, uh, and we hope we can get you to do that sometime in the future as well. Uh, so I want to thank you, Joe, uh, for all of us for truly an incredibly amazing, detailed, but very clearly explained talk on uh, on a lot of technical stuff, and uh, and and explains everything we see every day here in the valley. So truly, truly outstanding. I, I want to remind our audience that on August 3rd, we will have a live talk at St. John's in Hanson Hall, and it's about